know, we wanted to see how the, when our text and engineer work together, how the, the work can be not only engineering power, but also artificially, it is very pleasing. I think it's really good that uh, the importance of aesthetics, importance of, of importance of structure being expressed has been sort of uh, talked here. And I think your uh, this presentation, he almost talks like an engineer now, because I think, I think he's been with engineers, worked with engineers a lot. So your language is becoming more engineer-like. <laughs> you, you talk about letter code, not horizontal code, which is, a, which is an engineering term. And let me also share with you that um, we were very fortunate to work on that Starview project with Kun Sayan, and we actually did the performance-based evaluation of that project. It's one of the few projects in Thailand for which DVD has been convert, has been done. And one thing that we found in this project when we finished that project is that the DC ratios, we talked a lot about DC ratios and the good range. This project has one of the closest DC ratios to 0 0.7, 0 0.6. We were really amazed with the foundation when we checked it and the client asked me in one of the presentation when we were presenting that can you recommend something to optimize the cost. When we showed them a plan which Kunkurati has prepared in which we plotted on the foundation the DC ratios of the foundation with the tiles and the columns. And it was amazing. None of them was less than 0.6. We were 3.6 to 0.8. Very, very well balanced design. And we also noticed in this building, as you mentioned, the columns had minimal reinforcement, very minimal reinforcement because of the distributed core system. We actually yesterday talked about the distributed core and how it is efficient. And I think this building demonstrates that. In fact, columns we actually recommended Kunsayan to, if, if they want, they can actually reduce the uh, reinforcement further. And there's, there was no need for uh, confinement in those columns also because the performance came out to be so good. Because everybody was concerned about the movement of the two towers and the forces imposed on the swimming pool and whether they will you know, separate, what will happen. So we, we spent a lot of time, and I think this is one of the projects that really enjoyed working with the A49. So thank you so much. Thank you. Especially, we really learned a lot. And he has done, they have done very interesting projects. If you go to, if I'm not mistaken, the Bangkok University is also. So if you go to, Thai, to AIT tomorrow, please look onto your left. You will find the only unique and interesting building on the way on the left. Uh, I think uh, uh, I can see Alex making the form. Uh, and that is done also with them. It's, it's, a, it's a, uh, in engineering and architecture combined together. It's a beautiful structure. So I think these many of these interesting buildings have been done by them. So once again, thank you so much for your presentation. So let me just, thank you. Okay, let me just continue with our next talk on smart smart structures or smart things for structures or smart devices. Uh, as you know, everything is getting smarter. We see smartness everywhere. People are trying to make everything labeled smart. And I do hope that in this, in this uh, race, the human beings don't get left behind and everything will get smart except the human beings. But if you talk about smart, you can see around us, you have smart phone, smart car, smart TV, smart home, smart street city, everything smart. Uh, tourism smart, dress smart, whatever. So one of the things that we will talk about is how this smart thing affects the structures. <laughs> If you look at the smart city concept, uh, smart city is a very you know sort of common phrase being used everywhere. Uh, in India and in many countries, they want to build 100 smart cities. What does it mean? It means a lot. If you look at the this this smart city typical uh, you know plan, you will see 20, 25 things that have to become uh, intelligent, so to speak, or smart to make the city smart. And one of them will be the structure. So if you look at that, smart city, smart building, part of that, and then smart structure, part of the smart building, and smart devices, part of the smart build, smart structure, and smart materials, part of the smart devices. So we are talking about going from a smart city down to smart materials. And each level means something. And let's see, so we are, I'm just going to talk about today some smart structures, smart devices, and smart materials on that side and see how we are able to use them in our buildings. Everybody knows this, have seen this, it's an icon. People have seen everywhere 101, Taipei 101, the damper hanging there, one of the first major application, public demonstration of the dampers, masculine dampers. And 
the smartness that the structure gets from there. And as you remember, this was actually kind of tested during construction and they had an earthquake. So this is one of the things. So if you look at this, the, the reason, why do we need smart structure? Why the structures have to be smart? And are the structures down right now? What does it mean? The, the, the most important thing is that excitation fluctuates, so demand fluctuates. So, because everything is changing, temperature is changing, wind is changing, earthquake is changing, uh, water levels are changing, everything is changing. That means excitation is always changing. So that means the demand for the structural elements must also be changing with that as a response. So if the excitation is changing, demand is changing, but one thing is constant, capacity. Because we designed it and we built it, we put the reinforcement there, so the capacity becomes constant, but the demand is changing. So which means that there is now a problem between the demand and capacity because the capacity ratios that we calculated, as I mentioned earlier, are based on a certain state of the structure, a certain time that may or may never come. Therefore, the level of safety is not consistent. It is also changing with time. Sometimes we have the same structure over design and sometimes the structure may become, so to speak, unsafe or under design. So the level of safety that we talk about is actually not a constant number. It's a state or time dependent. It varies with time. Today, the structure is more safe than tomorrow because of the creep, whatever is happening. So which means that the safety that we put in the structure is not a single number. It is just a very arbitrary number that has been calculated based on arbitrary load factors and arbitrary uh, combination of loads and so on, which may actually never come. We say the that load combined with that load, with that load, with this factor, that factor, that factor, it will not happen that way. So this <coughs> factor of safety or the safety itself definition is not very good because it is not real. So the reason is that we want smart structures because the, typically the capacity is designed based on peak estimated demands. So we calculate the peak from whatever. And we say, okay, this is the peak. And I would design for peak that the peak may be coming from ground motion, the peak may be coming from wind hourly speed, the peak may be coming from combination of the loads, like load placement, whatever. So we are looking at peak, and then we design for that peak, which may happen sometimes in some location, and not in other times in other locations. So what if the, the, the next question is, what if the peak never comes? Which means our structure is uneconomical. That means we design for a peak which will never come. So we over-design, we spend the materials, we waste resources, it's unsustainable. And second question, equally important, is what if the demand exceeds the estimated peak? Then it becomes unsafe. So we have both situations. Most of the structure, most of the time, most of the life of the structure is, it is actually uneconomical. It's over-designed because it is designed for a peak with based on probability and everything and load factors, which actually does not realize in most of the time it won't happen. Only rare occasions it will be exceeded. Earthquake being one, blast being another, and some other uh, other instances. But most of the time this will not be the case. So we are we end up with a structure which is actually uneconomical. And that's where the smartness comes in. So let's talk about this very simple case. Please just speak. Normally when we design this test beam, we balance a certain load with the post tensioning. So that is in a perfect harmony, the load is balanced with PT. But if the load pattern changes or the load changes, PT cannot change. So then we do not have the safety or we do not have the economy that we, we design for. You know very well that with PT there is no load, the wind beam bends, bends upwards. So we need that load even to keep it straight. And if the load is different than the for which we designed the PT strand profile, then that means PT will not be efficient anymore. That's why in cyclic loading, we tend not to use PT because the load is changing. So PT cannot respond to that. But if PT could respond, if the post tensioning could respond with the varying load, that would be smart PT. That would be nice. So the force keeps changing as the load keeps changing, or the profile keeps changing as the load keeps changing, then it would be really nice. So that's the, the, the simple example of a smart system. Key fluctuating excitations, we have wind, earthquake, vibrating loads, other 
and, you know, others like flood, temperature, settlement, creep, and everything time dependent. In fact, everything is time dependent, so it's changing. Some change rapidly, some change slowly, but they all change. So if they all of them are changing, even light load in this room is changing. Everybody walks out, everybody walks in, light load is changing. The pattern is changing. So there is a constant change of excitation on the structures. What are the main things that we are concerned as engineers? We are concerned about the response, we are concerned about the, demand, the, the deformation, we are con concerned about the drift, we are concerned about the acceleration, we are concerned about the dissipated energy, we are concerned about stresses and strain. So we are concerned about all these things which are linked to demand. So if demand is varying, all of these responses will, will change and will be varying, but we are concerned about their limits at some point. Stiffness, pen, utility, damping, all of those are other concerns. So these are the things that we are concerned about when we talk about structural response to excitation. So if we want to make something smart, we need to look at these response, we look, need to look at the excitation, and we need to find a way not to over-design the structure for a thing that will not come, but when it comes, the structure must respond with safety. So the ability, the, the start smart structure could be, is the ability to change the values of response controllers to modify the response, number one, and Based on fluctuation of excitement and demand, it should also be able to, to change the capacity if needed. So the demand can be adjusted, that's number one, function of the smart structure, and if needed, capacity can be modified too. So if we are able to do that, then we can design for levels not necessarily peak, then we can design for a median level and leave the peak to the devices. And the capacity is then de de designed based on the let's say average demand or some other demand level, and we leave the peak to be handled by the smart, smartness of the structure. So, smart structures. Smart structures have the ability to sense any change in external actions, that's number one. Number two, diagnose the problem at critical locations, number two, measure and process the data, number three, and take appropriate measures to rectify just like human beings. If you sense danger, you evaluate the danger, you may make, you know, get some options, you may take an action. So in the same way, the structures can and should be able to do that, or if they're able to do that, then we, we can say that these are smart structures. And we can divide these smart, smart structures into four categories. Energy dissipation systems, active or passive control systems, health monitoring system and data acquisition system. So these are the devices that make up the smart structure. So we need to, to acquire data, we need to process it, we need to, to take action using some of the options that we have. So the, the application of smart structures is subject, such structures subjected to extraordinary vibration, not the normal <laughs> one, important structures with critical functionality and flexible structures with high serviceability requirements. So there are many other instances, but these are the, this, this, some of the key ones. First of all, a lot of, because this is a new review presentation, so the material is taken from this reference. So this is a very good reference. If you can read the whole paper, it would be nice. We took some of the material from this uh, publication. Let me get back to dynamics again. Yesterday, I, I, I mentioned that dynamics is the key. So let's go back to that dynamics equation one more time. And remember that we have a relationship between mass, acceleration, stiffness, and the load. That is, the one on the top is the dumb structure, make the bare structure. But if you add to it a uh, smartness, a uh, device, control device, which is smart, then this, this whole equation is modified by adding the components coming from the smart structure. So the smart structure will add to the, let, let's go there in a, in a minute. So, here. So we take that equation and then we add smart, smartness to that. We will see that we can add now mass of the structure plus the mass of the controlling device, so mass will be added because the, that device may have a mass. Then the damping of the structure plus the damping of the device. So damping can be modified 
stiffness of the structure plus the stiffness of the device, so the stiffness can be modified, and even the demand side, we can have the mass component into the dot motion excitation. So now we have this modified equation of the dynamics where the smart device or the controlling device becomes an integral part of the equation solution, which means these values of mass, damping, stiffness can be modified to create, to change the equilibrium as needed. And that's where the smart structures come in. And that's why I was saying the dynamics is the key. And so we can go back to the dynamics <coughs> and modify the equation by adding or subtracting something from each term as needed. So first of all, let's look at the damping systems. This is a typical damping system. You are all, many of you are familiar with that. This is quite common. You take a structure, you add some kind of a damper, inclined damper. These dampers come in all kind of form. Yesterday we had an excellent presentation. No, first day. Yeah, first day we had a very good presentation about the use of viscous dampers uh, and how it impacts or how it is very efficient. So we can add dampers of all kind. That is not this kind of damper, but damper can be added. BRB, for example, buckling restraint brace is another kind of damper that we are using quite a lot. In fact, one of the first applications in this region was in a project in the Philippines. Uh, what's that called? Park terraces, I'm sorry. Park terraces, which we did together with uh, uh, SY Square. In fact, we had a whole PhD, four year, four year PhD done on that building when we put in the BRBs there. So it took a lot of time to understand, for us to understand. But since then, I think we published five papers on that. So since then, we have been using that a lot. So that is one device which has a lot of good stiffness and also has a good damping, good utility, everything. So it's a good smart device. Then we can talk about other passive control. So we can talk about the categories of devices, passive, semi-active, and active, and hybrid. Basically, it's all the same. We take four levels of interaction with the structure. Passive means that it just is there. It has some, some stiffness, some mass, which it, it acts, but it doesn't change with demand so much. But it adds or modifies the structure. Let's look at them in a little bit more detail. Passive control system, I have to go a bit fast, uh, because it's a lot of information uh, that you can read later. So passive control systems are that they do not require any external power or source. So they are the, the, their smartness is within the system itself. So they are just designed to absorb at some level. So they, are, they become active at certain load level or excitation level beyond. So they change their behavior internally, but you do not need external power or you do not need any sensors, any monitoring to do that. So these are the passive devices. So passive devices can be categorized into uh, tube mass dampers, tube liquid dampers, friction devices, metallic field devices, viscoelastic dampers, and fluid uh, viscous dampers. So all of these dampers of various kind, they are classified as passive. Uh, we, you know, the Tiger 101 uses a mass tube damper. In, in Thailand, uh, Mr. Pennant has designed several buildings with, mass, with liquid tube dampers. Uh, just use the water tank and uh, adjust the water tank dimensions and the, uh, put some wire, wire mesh in there to change the viscosity of water. And then you, you control the building by the water sloshing. So liquid tube dampers are very easy to build and very, very uh, you know, economical because they're just water tanks and the water that you can also use for other purposes. Uh, this is a tube mass dampers, just a mass tuned to respond in the opposite direction as, as needed. And this is most common, the first kind of dampers that was used or developed. These are the tuned liquid, liquid dampers where the motion of the liquid is instead of the mass, the motion of the liquid, the wave, wave, the wave action, and also the movement of the liquid. Uh, in fact, there's a building in, in, in Bangkok where we are planning to build, uh, because Spanish team is working on it, to build a liquid tuned damper visible to the public. So public will be able to see the sloshing of the water, just like the Taibo 101, where people can see the mass moving. But public, public will be able to see the water tank with wind blowing and the water waves resisting the wind. So it will be very interesting 
for it's like a, you know it's, 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 it would be nice to watch that liquid green fume damper in action. So people can walk around that and they can see how the sloshing is controlling the building movement in wind. Friction devices, they are quite common. This is also used a lot in steel, K, K braces, uh, uh, many other types of braces. Uh, metallic green devices, we rely on the yielding of the metal uh, to, to, do, to provide the uh, damping. Viscoelastic dampers, we saw some example yesterday based on the shear deformations of, of the material. Semi-active dampers, basically you take a passive damper or passive device and then you add a little bit of intelligence to it or a little bit of uh, uh, modification uh, parameters to it. So not only it's passive, but it is, it is able to change some of its properties based on the input. So now we need uh, a way to sense the input and a way to change the properties of the uh, passive damper. So it's no longer passive, it is semi-active, which means that it changes some of its properties, but still cannot add much force or much input to the structure. Uh, this is quite common. So working principle is that a computer processor processes the vibration measurements coming from the sensors, generates the commands for the control, and they change some parameters, modify the properties, and then the, the behavior changes. So this is a little bit smarter than the passive one. So that, that is how it will work. You know, it's like uh, we have a control mechanism and all of that. I, I don't want to go into too much detail because uh, uh, I think the detailed working of each one of them requires considerable time to explain. The main advantage is are that now these additional adaptive system can collect the and process the data, so it can adjust the response to the peak more efficiently than a passive one. Because now we do not need to design for the peak and leave the peak for the device to change, and that's one of the first step towards the more active tempers. The limitation is that the capacity of this additional is limited. You cannot change a lot. So it adds a little bit, but it's not unlimited. So that additional semi-active portion is not a major uh, contribution. So it is good for smaller excitation levels, like controlling some vibrations and, and maybe weight in some cases, but not so good for large, uh, large forces or large radiation forces. So common semi-active control devices are the same. So semi-active tube mass, same. Tube mass tampers, semi-active. Semi-active liquid water level can be changed or more water can be, or the, the wire meshes can be moved inside so the, 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 the viscosity can be changed. So it can do something. For example, changing the location of the screens or changing the water level. Uh, those are the things that can be done. Similarly, for the mass, active mass, the, the mass contributing to that can be changed with spring mechanism or locking mechanism and so on. Semi-active friction dampers, semi-active vibration absorbers. You know, in the cars, there are these, the, the difference between if you ride uh, a car, uh, an economy car and a luxury car, you feel the difference when it passes over a speed bump. I remember one of the participants from BMW used to be that there's a speed bump and they, they show the light beam coming from there and when the car passes over that bump, the lights remain straight. Whereas when the car, ordinary car passes over, the light goes like this because the car is going over the bump. And one of the key things they developed at that time with the advertised lot was these um, adaptive shock absorbers that will sense the vibration and change the properties. So the, the shock absorbers uh, or the dampers in the car will change the properties so the car will have a smoother ride completely. And that's what the structures can also do, uh, that sense and change the properties of the dampers so the structure gets a smoother ride. Active controls, next stage is more active, not semi-active, but almost fully active. So in this case, then we have the, the basically, uh, they use now electrical power, now power comes in. So either it is electrical power 
or it's a mechanical power, or it's electromagnetic mag mag magnetic power, some kind of power source comes in. They need power, energy, to add additional uh, sort of uh, ability to respond to the changing uh, demands. So these are suitable for uh, many situations because they can be designed to add or subtract the, the forces in addition to changing the basic properties. So this one, you need a complete loop system, feedback loop, loop system, you have sensors, you have uh, uh, you know, measurement, and then it activates the actuators, or it changes the properties, electrical currents, or adds power, reduces power. So anything is happening. <coughs> These are complicated mechanical devices, electromechanical devices, and they have a complete normal mechanical, just like similar to what I described for a car. So they have all those mechanisms to adjust things, and uh, then they add. Uh, the additional properties or subtract the, proper, uh, the additional forces into the system. So the typical categories are active mass tempers, active tendon systems, active ray systems, and pulse generator systems. So these are various categories where you can where we can use these these active devices. Uh, one of these, as you can see here, the typical diagram is that now the mass is is connected to actuators and other, other things. So not only the mass can be is moving by through vibration, the mass movement can be slowed down or increased by an actuator to increase its damping effect. So it's not that just the free mass with a damper and the spring is moving, you have an actuator to control it and that can respond more accurately to the input motion or input characteristics because this actuator can adjust the movement of the mass in the the damper. So AMP, as, as I mentioned, so this whole dynamics changes. So there's a lot of actuators around the mass in all directions. It's not just a mass. It's not just a free swinging pendulum anymore. It's a pendulum with many actuators to control uh, which way it will go and how much it will move. Active tendon systems. These are tendons. Uh, but their tension can be changed. So if you want to increase the bracing, then the, ten the tension in the tendon is controlled by actuators. So if you require more tension, it will you know, tend to tense itself. If not, it will relax itself. So that it will always be able to remain in tension and not uh, leave the load for the other side of the So both sides can, be, can remain active. So this is an active tendon system. It is just like human beings. When we walk, our tendons are the active tendon system. We keep adjusting them through the muscle movement. And as the load comes in, we keep changing that. So we have a very good muscle and, uh, and active tendon system in our body. And this is exactly derived from there. This is active brace system. Instead of the uh, tendon, it's a brace which is also controlled. The brace is controlled by a lateral load. So the, the, the force in the brace is controlled by, by moving the angle or changing the, the direction. So it's, it's also similar to the active tendon, but it controls the bracing force in the other direction. Limitations of active control systems obviously is that you cannot apply unlimited forces. So the actuators have limits. Otherwise, it would become very expensive to have very large actuator actuators. So within reason, the active SID devices can work very well, but not, again, not for very large structures, not for very large forces. There are other things that you can do with very large structures. And that is hybrid systems. Hybrid systems now combine many things. The concept, three concepts are combined together and make one device, smart device, it is really smart. It has many components. It has passive component, it has semi-active, it has active, and it's a hybrid. And it can combine several devices, several uh, things together to create one comprehensive uh, control system. So hybrid mass tempers, hybrid base isolators, hybrid tempered actuators, and intelligent hybrid control system. So it's really not going way into the future kind of thing that you are, it's, it's no, longer, no longer structural engineering. It's more like mechanical and electrical engineering. 
So these are, as you can see, that even the TMD itself is controlled by another small TMD or AMD on top of that. So the, the response of the TMD is now controlled by another small mass, which controls this, which controls the bigger one. So these are composites. So that means you can build upon one device and you can add multiple devices to add more control uh, into the control devices. Similarly, this one is a hybrid waste isolation system. So it has a waste isolation together with active tendons and so on. So you can distribute part of the energy here, part of the force there, part of the space. One fails, another goes in, or they distribute part. So it, the total system becomes quite effective because each component or each part of the system is taking care of some fluctuation, of the demand fluctuation. So the total overall range becomes longer and larger. This is a hybrid temperate actuator raising system, as I mentioned. So simply people are now thinking, oh, if I have this, why don't we add that? Why don't we add that and make it more comprehensive or add more functionality into that? So it's now put, putting together devices that have already been developed and then combining them together to provide greater functionality. Intelligent hybrid control system, so they are keeping track which portion should act when, which portion will be most efficient now, and so on. And intelligent hybrid control system, they have many logics, many controllers, many components, each one controlled by the, the demand levels, by, by logic, where, which, which, which part of the computer device will work best for this variation. And so it's a really complex computer system with sensors, with actuators, with dampers, with uh, uh, you know, all kinds of devices put together and installed in various parts of the structure. We were just talking to Bikun Sayan that we should start to put some monitoring devices onto this Starview project because we have two towers which are moving. So it would be nice to measure the relative movement or the inspiration or the movement and that location. So we are thinking about just to see how those structures that we design behave in reality. So, waste isolation system, the last one in the category, uh, this you have all heard about. The idea is that for earthquakes, isolate the base. That means don't let the ground motion go to the uh, structure at all. So, let the structure be free, free flowing. That means the, let the ground move, but not the structure move. Of course, it has limitations, but this is very good for very sensitive structures where you can completely isolate or mostly isolate the structure from the ground motion and the structure's mass is not activated, so the forces are not generated. And they reduce the energy transfer from ground exploration to the system, and that is very good because this really can save the entire structure. Uh, many examples where existing buildings have been fitted with base aspirations in America, in Japan, uh, the most uh, Famous example is the town hall in San Francisco, which is a very, it's a heritage building. Uh, and then they actually went down. Actually, uh, I was in the Philippines uh, last few weeks ago. There was a very good presentation from, uh, they did in Turkey, right? In the ASAC. So they, they showed how they went down, cut all the columns uh, on the top of the head, and they installed these aspirators on the head of every column and the base of the shear wall. So they completely disconnected the building from the ground motion. And it was amazing to see that they just simply slice the column off and put, inserted the, the, you know, as an engineer, we are so kind of uh, concerned about the vertical reinforcement passing through the column that if somebody comes and just cuts the column reinforcement completely off, we are not so comfortable. But actually that's what they did. They cut the columns, all the columns, one by one, and put a gap in between, and then put an um, uh, isolator there, and that's it. Nothing, no reinforcement going through. So it's scary, but it works very well because it isolates the base from the ground motion, uh, from the structure. So there are many kinds of this one elastomeric, uh, like 
I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but just to give you an idea, the base isolation systems are uh, very good and they can be used efficiently, not so much for tall buildings. For, so they, they normally are good for low rise buildings. So the, these base isolation systems are not really good for, for tall buildings, we use other devices that I mentioned earlier. Base isolators are good for low rise but important buildings. So there are so many, type, so many type of these uh, bearings are there. Simple bearings like the, 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 kind, of, the, the kind used in bridges, uh, pot bearings, uh, spherical bearings, rotational bearings, uh, all kinds of bearings. And you see them in the bridges all the time. So we can also apply them into buildings. Uh, we can put them under the, 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 between the foundation mat and the column, or above the, the first floor columns, and basically isolate the whole building. In fact, there's another project that was presented yesterday uh, from Nanswan, and that also has a small tower and a big tower with a pool. And over there, we went completely the other way. Uh, unlike Starview, we actually separated the two towers by a bearing system. Because over there, the movement was too large to control. So we decided, and we actually did several studies, if we connect what happens, and we found that if we connect the two towers in that case, the taller tower will will transfer so much force to the shorter tower that it would be very difficult to design that. So we decided that to let the longer tower vibrate and then put a separator or bear in there. So sensing data and acquisition are all part of these devices. We need all these systems and we need smart. So basically, now if I could just conclude in a couple of slides, Basically, we are talking about a combination of structural engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, software, electrical engineering, electromagnetics, and everything put together to find a solution to control the structure's peak demand response. So either reduce the demand or respond to peak demand differently so the rest of the structure can be, doesn't have to be designed for very high demand values. So ultimately, it would be cheaper for the structure. If we put the smart devices in the right way and select the right smart device, we put just like what Voices team presented on the first day where they put those uh, dampers and they found that it is a very good uh, option both for wind and earthquake. So let's just say that smart structures use smart devices and materials to add some intelligence to adapt, react, adjust, respond, and handle multiple demand, demand levels as and when needed. That's the key. And it helps to make the structure safer, especially for earthquake and wind. Thank you.